button clicked. Welcome in to another episode of the Cover One Film Room, part of the Cover One Sports Network. I am one of your co-hosts tonight, Anthony Prohaska, joined tonight by Mr. Eric Turner. Eric, Kendall has stabbed us in the back, and he's <laughs> he's gone back home to Rochester to visit yeah. family, and he's the not rock. with us tonight. Yeah, with, uh, down there in the rock, and... Just what a traitor he is for bailing on us. I just, just yeah, disappointed. And to make it worse, he's posting all the food from Western oh. New York and just rubbing oh. it in. What? You know, like you know, like obviously I can't just go out and get a, oh. a good slice of Pontillo's pizza. He's taunting or, you. Or, yeah, he is, man. You know, so yeah, Which we're mean? gonna you know we're gonna go on without him. Uh, but uh, he's been you know like you had. You guys have been grinding nonstop for, I mean, months now. You guys haven't <laughs> yeah. had a chance to take a, a day off from the grind. So uh, we'll give him the day off. He's a young buck. He can uh, refuel uh, back home in, in, in the rock, and then I'm sure he'll be back in the film room with us soon enough. Yeah, he's he's a grinder. He's he's built in that uh that workhorse frame and yeah. model. And, yeah, so shout out to him enjoying some time with the family back home and a bunch of good food and – We've got a very fun episode for you guys tonight. As you guys know, you know, the based on the episode title, we're going to dive into Mr. Carlos Boogie Basham and speak on his game last year, show you guys some film and some clips and talk about, you know, how he's going to build upon that rookie year and what we can expect coming into year two and his usage last year, what that could mean for this year, how he's shown up into OTA so far and all that kind of stuff. But before we dive into full Boogie Basham, mode there oh nice comment there from jessica uh, Boogie Boogie has bruce a similar mode. Bruce. <laughs> oh bruce mode that's a good one um you know otas is you know a trending topic as uh as we dive into this episode here what's up jay thank you for joining us here and thank you to everybody who's joining us live we want to yeah, engage with everyone yeah as, as we always do here questions thoughts comments concerns anything you guys got we love just the live interaction and engagement here um in the cover one film as we do with cover one as a whole so we appreciate everybody joining us live drop a like on this video if you're here with us live and throw some stuff up in the chat and let's get it popping and get it going and eric OTAs week two have officially kicked off starting today. And one of the main highlights or focal points of today was new offensive coordinator, Mr. Ken Dorsey, someone yeah. who you and I have talked about a little bit, you know, in front of the curtain and on shows, but a decent amount, you know, offline and in the DMS talking about, you know, what he, how he embraces this offensive coordinator role. And we like the consistency. We like that, you know, Josh feels comfortable with the verbiage and the terminology and the relationship, but there are a fair amount of questions that can be asked when it comes to his play calling duties and that yeah. hat that he has to wear and the responsibilities that he has to shoulder. And he spoke about a lot of that today. And, and how do you feel? Oh, we, we have to stop. Silas is kicking it off right off the we bat. Stop. Silas came right in. You guys know the rules. Super chats get priority. Silas says, I've been waiting for this video. And he got a bold, a bold Ooh. take from Silas. He's saying seven and a half sacks for 55. For those of you who don't know, Jerry Hughes no longer with the Buffalo Bills. Carlos Boogie Basham has taken on that 55 from Jerry. Hopefully, um, he pays homage and does that well. Thank you very much for the super chat, super yeah, chat, thank you, Silas. Silas. Yeah, big time. Thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you for the comment. I'm going to pull up this one too real quick. I love that Jason says he's here for the tree. <laughs> he gets it. He understands it. He's here for the tree. Um, but Eric, yeah, Ken Dorsey spoke today on – you know, getting kind of in that rhythm and getting adjusted to wearing that play caller hat and, you know, fully embracing those responsibilities. Yeah. What did you think about what he said today? Well, it was a, uh, it was a good presser. It was like 23, 25 minutes long. Um, the thing I took from it is exactly what you're talking about, man. And it's something that I've been talking about in the Slack channel for our premium subscribers pretty much every other day, because I want you guys to keep it in the forefront, not let it, you know, slip to the back and let the homerism come out because we are all excited about this team. We are all mm -hmm. excited about some of the changes that uh, they have undergone as far as personnel, as far as coaching and specifically Ken Dorsey and what he can bring and his wrinkles and his play style. But when they asked him today, you know, his response kind of falls in line with what we've been trying to say is that you got to take it with a grain of salt because this team is complete from top to bottom. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that is really, you know, that, that is an unknown is really Ken Dorsey, the OC. And okay. so, and it specifically him calling plays and when the bullets are flying and when, you know, they're out there and it's third and three, you know, with 
10 seconds on the line and they're trying to get in the field goal range. Like, what's he going to call? And they asked him straight up, like, how do you practice play calling? And he says, mm -hmm. well, sometimes in practice, we'll, you know, we'll have segments. Uh, the coaching staff kind of builds that into some of their practices. Sometimes yeah, he has an assistant kind of give him a down and distance and he'll throw out a play that he would run. And he does that also. Um, that exercise also when he's watching film at times, you know, going mm -hmm. through a game and, and, and the scenarios and down and distances that come up, it just really showed how green he is when it comes to play calling. And we're not going to know his play style. We're not going to know what he likes. We're not going to know what personnel he likes and what mm -hmm. personnel he can count on until the season starts. And he even mentioned that, you know, usually uh, when all things are, you know, said and done, like usually you don't know those things till the first few weeks. And that's just talking about a guy that's been calling plays. So, for a guy that hasn't called plays in a live game, it's something to keep in mind, guys. I don't want to, people to panic, but like I said, this <laughs> team is so complete. The only unknown really is some of the coaching staff changes on the offensive side of the ball and specifically Ken Dorsey calling plays. And that's a, I think that's a fair – it's so funny because I feel like everybody's going to be like, what? He's gonna, he's not going to be good at calling plays? Oh, my yeah. God. Like It's like, no, it's not to that it's level. Different. but. It, it is different. You nailed it, you know, and that's why I wanted to preface it with, you know, it being something because we've mentioned it here and there, you know, on air. And then, like you mentioned, you talked about it a lot in the Slack channel. You and I have talked about it in the DMs. Mm -hmm. It's a fair, fair concern. And not because it's, you know, like a negative or he can't do it, but it's literally just an unknown quantity. And when right. you have so many known quantities around you, Josh Allen, who is – a top five player in the NFL and arguably the best quarterback. Some people might even go out and say that he's the best player in the NFL. And then you've got a top player's position in Stefan Diggs. You have what looks to be a tremendous supporting cast of weapons and the offensive line has come together a bit. And you've got really great coaching, you know, on the offensive line now with Aaron Cromer, like you have all these known quantities, like, you know, what you're going to get from Josh Allen, you know, what you're going to get from Stefan Diggs and Aaron Cromer and Gabriel Davis and Dawson Knox, so on and so forth. But the guy who's really stirring that drink and who's serving that up is Ken Dorsey. And yeah, yeah he's he's going to have to get in a rhythm. He's going to have to adjust. And that was one of the highlights, too, for me um, from today. That, and this is something that I hadn't even thought about. Um, Dorsey today said that uh, he's made a concerted effort this year to be in each room talking about the yeah. position yeah. grouping rooms. And I didn't even think of that like the – how that, how that changes. Like he's so used to being in the quarterback room. Josh Allen talked about it last week in OTAs of how like he's always used to Dorse, like always being right. there with him, like on the practice field in the room. And now that relationship changes a little bit and it, not just for Josh, but for Ken Dorsey, he's got to be like, uh Oh, I've been in the QB room too long. Like, let me go see what's up with tight ends or running backs right. or the old line. Like he's got to oversee all of that. And one more uh, piece from last week that I thought was really interesting related to Dorsey, Josh Allen, I, I, I took this as more of Josh Allen's attention to detail, but it's another piece for Dorsey as well. Josh wanted to get the repertoire and rhythm for the play calling on the headset and in the walkies because Josh was like, sometimes when you're talking through the microphone, mm -hmm. it can sound distorted or you might have to decipher things. Like Even that is going to be something that Ken Dorsey has to get used to, like the actual, not just calling plays, but like the physical medium that he uses to transmit his words. Like It's all adjustments, but... He's got right. Josh's faith. He obviously has Sean McDermott's and Brandon Bean's faith. And I think that's something that is interesting to keep an eye on. And everybody, you know, we don't want anybody to panic here. We're not trying to incite a riot. But that's something that I think is interesting early on for this season. Eric, you know, this, this is a question I want to ask you related to this. Because somebody asked me this last week uh, on Disguise Coverage. Like, mm -hmm. when during the regular season – do you think we'll truly be seeing like what Ken Dorsey wants this offense to be and what he wants this team to be? Because in relation to this, those first several weeks, even the first month, you're going to get kind of that feeling out process of, you know, what NFL defenses are doing and what it's like for him to call plays and get into a rhythm and read and react in real time and adjust. Is there a time frame or a timeline you think in like, okay, you know, by week eight, you know, we'll know what this offense is or by week 10, or is it something that you think maybe takes longer than that, given this is his first time accepting these duties? Every year is different, right? And every year you have, you, you kind of treat the season as quarters. You always hear that, hey, mm -hmm. let's get through the first four games. And the, the reason why, why they say that is because so much of the game plans, the, the nuts and bolts of a game plan is actually kind of produced in the off season. I know it's not mm -hmm. talked about a lot, but defenses that the bills are going to see have a certain structure to it and they defend certain things, certain ways, no matter 
you know, who they're playing against. And so some of the blueprints, you know, that are, are made for how they're going to attack these defenses are actually kind of scripted now. Then, you know, mm-hmm. as the season goes on and they see how defenses are changing or some tweaks were added in the offseason, then they start kind of curating and tailoring that specific game plan. So, but they, they do it in sequences, right? So that first four games, they're going to do have certain plays that kind of look alike, have a similar sequencing uh, so that it all blends well together. That's what's so scary about, you know, Ken Dorsey not being a play caller, not having done this really, mm-hmm. because all of that preparation is done now. He talked about, taking some things away from Dable's offense, subtracting mm-hmm. him, adding some, you know, his new wrinkles and stuff like that. But he's got to keep the same volume. You got to keep that same mm-hmm. 70 to hundred plays each week, but you just kind of subtract some concepts here or there um, within the season or even in the off season, off season going in. But if you don't have these certain concepts for the players and personnel you have in the base offense at the beginning of the season, in the off season, when you're teaching this and reteaching it two or three times going into mini camps, that can affect you down down the line when we're mm-hmm. talking in that fourth quarter of the year, you know. So um, I think that it's not talked about enough, but this offseason and these installs uh, are important. But again, priority wise, they're not atop the list. But the basic techniques, the schemes, some of the concepts, the core concepts are going to be installed here and then just retaught two or three times leading into the season. I love that point. Um Again, this is something that I think we spoke last year during during the film on. Like, I feel like people don't understand how much your in season game planning is really set. Not completely, but the foundation right. is heavily built upon in this off season for you building towards that and what you're going towards. And you know, in terms of seeing what this Bills offense is, you know, it's probably not the answer people want to hear. But no, again, no two situations are the same and you got to have patience. You know, if things aren't clicking by week two or week three, it's not time to be like, this was a horrible hire. This was a mistake. It's not going to work. You have to give everything time. And in in the same vein on the opposite side, right? If the bills are putting up 40 points a game in the first three weeks, do not sit there and be like, Oh my God, this is the greatest offense in NFL history. We're never going to be stopped because things can turn on a dime. Exactly. Like you said, more film, right? The more film. Yes. That's what's so tough. Like you want to kind of keep some things in your bag. You don't want to throw it all out there by the, by the first quarter or the midway point of the season, because then come the back end, especially in your division, when teams have already seen you and then they've got other tape or when it comes time uh, for playoff time in, in football, in the NFL, situational things are so important. That's even more so not even your holistic game plan and your tendency, but what you do in situations. What do they like to do on third and short? What do they like to do on second and long from inside the 40? What does their red zone package and personnel look like? All of those things are diagrammable and you can blow them up and dive into them if you're the opponent based on how you've displayed that as an offense throughout the year. And it's a very delicate balance. It's not just, oh, you know, just go in and call plays and, you know, see what happens and put up points. It's a very delicate balance. It's a fine science. And one of those areas, you know, that I just mentioned there was, you know, some red zone work. And we know the Bills last year used a ton of RPOs in the red zone. And Eric, you've done a really good job here uh, prepping this video, uh, showing Mr. Ken Dorsey working with the Bills receivers here um, on some RPOs and that first window throw there. Yeah, you know, it's uh, as you said, the Bills run RPOs a lot. I think they were fifth or sixth most RPOs last year. If, uh, yeah, fifth. if you could pull those numbers, yeah. So they run a lot of RPOs, and obviously, Josh Allen's not at OTAs today because he has what the match tomorrow with Mahomes. So you saw mm-hmm. OC Ken Dorsey uh, out there. This is courtesy of Matt Perino. Um, you see him out there throwing some heaters, man. He's throwing some fastballs, and people that are just they're they're in the comments that you look at him, they say, "Hey, I'm kind of." kind of bummed that so many guys are dropping these balls, but this is what practice is for guys. And, and the reason he's throwing this so, so hard at these guys is because again, it's an RPO. It's a quick hitting play. You're getting it from Josh Allen. I mean, think about some of the quick slant type touchdowns to Diggs, to Davis, John Brown, even Beasley ran it from the slot. And that's all they're running here. They're working around that first bag and they're getting that fastball in that first window. And of course, obviously kind of preparing, for a hit, obviously not happening at OTAs here, but uh, just getting them in that mindset. And yes, there are some guys dropping some balls here, including uh, Gabriel Davis, I think the second receiver here, but again, this is practice. And again, even, even little details like, Hey, you're catching a ball from a different, different thrower uh, mm-hmm. than Josh Allen. Like th- those things that, you know, take adjustments. So uh, not to, 
uh, you know, kind of cop out there, but it, it's just one of those things. Like, again, this is when you watch practice, teams are doing these drills for a reason. I always say yeah. add context to practice. We don't see that enough. Um, this is the context. This is an RPO drill working around that first bag in that first window, as Anthony said, just fun stuff. A little tidbit from uh, OTAs. Uh, today, if you guys saw anything on the timeline, we both worked today, so we didn't, we weren't able to catch up on all the OTA stuff. But if there's mm-hmm. something you guys want us to discuss, go ahead and shoot it in the comment section. We can talk about it. I love that drill, and I love that you pulled it for this because, again, like the context and like I feel like this is something that even the casual fan can see and be like, oh, I feel like I've seen this before. Like you see it all the time. You see that fake from Josh Allen. You see Stefan Diggs clear that nickel defender or that apex defender and get into that first window or how Smoke many times Jay-Z we Jackson see, boom, beautiful. <laughs> or how many times have we seen the opposite thing, things that we've broken down on this show applauding Josh Allen for because he goes to pull that trigger in the first window and then he pumps it and brings it back and we see the receiver clear and get to the second window and Allen fires it in. We've seen a lot of that from this offense and it's nice to see, you know, again, you're practicing these real world scenarios, real world situations. And it's cool that you've got, you know, an offensive coordinator now who, and Josh Allen talked about this last week, you know, Dorsey being a guy who, being a former quarterback, he understands what it's like to be back there and he can still throw the ball and he can still function in that world. So you know, it's nice to see. Who knows? Maybe we'll see Ken Dorsey take over for Josh Allen to be the starting quarterback this year. Hot take. Ken Dorsey, <laughs> offensive coordinator and starting quarterback. Maybe you save some money, right, financially, because you can pay one guy to do both <laughs> jobs. You're increasing cap space. We'll talk to Greg about it, see what uh, see what he thinks about that. Um, and, oh, I love Ned. Ned is always uh, sending stuff our way on. Oh, yeah. Uh, on Keeps us informed. <laughs> he, really, he really does. He sends me so many things that I know I wouldn't see on my own. Appreciate him so much for that. Um, and Ned, if you're watching, we appreciate you. Eric, uh, what did what did Ned send our way this time? Yeah, this is uh, courtesy of Sal Capaccio from WGR. And you just see Chad Hall. Uh, he has, like, some padded gloves on, like, MMA gloves. Um, and he just, again, getting those wide receivers to – uh, keep their frames clean. And, you know, it doesn't look like they're working on a specific uh, release or whatnot, just working on the hand usage. Again, that muscle mm-hmm. memory, those little things when, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Gabriel Davis is trying to release off the line of scrimmage and guys trying to jam him, having that muscle memory and that natural reaction to, to clear his frame and not let that guy get into his body is something that Chad Hall is really taught from the first day he was here. If you look at flashback here from July 28, 2019, uh, when I was down at camp, and it's something that if you guys, if we're lucky and camp falls at the end of July like we expected to, we're going to have a bunch of cover one guys at camp this mm. year, which I'm really excited. We're going to get a house. We're going to create all this content for you guys. So hopefully um, we get some of this type of content. But this was from 2019 where I, I had I was at camp and I was discussing how, again, Chad Hall was using those gloves to, to help the wide receivers um, you know, to release off the ball and, and keep their hands clean and release cleanly on the outside release here, as you can see, uh, as a, the pictures kind of flow through there. So yeah. um, this is something Chad Hall has always believed in. You know, over the years, the Bills at times, even, you know, having guys like Diggs and Beasley, guys that could separate quickly, there were times where teams like the Chiefs got a little handsy on them and really got into their frames. And so these type of drills kind of worked, again, that muscle memory, keeping that muscle memory up to par so that they can release off the line as quick as they can. Hand clearance is so important when it comes to getting off the line and being able to be solid in your release. And it's such an integral part of a receiver's release package. I love this drill. And it also highlights something that I've said it so many times this offseason. It was said to me um, by Brandon Thorne um, in a conversation we were having on Twitter that I – he he mentioned how the hand fighting and the battle between like receivers and corners often mirrors offensive linemen and defensive linemen, like the technique you're trying to use and how you're trying to get clean and how you're trying to get clear. And you see some of it here. Like it's a lot of the, you know, people make the jokes that it looks like karate or like fighting or like defensive, um, you know, tight, you're trying to defend your body from attacks, but exactly what you said, Eric, it is that muscle memory. So that way, when someone reaches for you with their inside hand, you don't have to think, okay, cool, let me do this. It's just a natural, like, Mr. Miyagi wax on, wax off type of thing where you just naturally, like, swipe and then all in one movement to get clear. Chad Hall is somebody who I feel like we don't talk about him enough in, like, public circles. Like, he is such a strong, strong position coach. And I could see him being somebody who, if the Bills continue to succeed as a team, he could be somebody who starts to get looks in terms of, like, higher promotional position opportunities with the success that he's had and just how high the Bills receivers always speak of him. 
Yeah, and he's he's a uh, he's very active, and I know like McDermott likes that. Uh, and you know, young coaches, especially because you know some of the coaching staff are the wiser ones that've been in the league for many years and are up there in age. Uh, yeah. And you have young coaches like this to kind of balance it out and relate to a young uh, wide receiver mm-hmm. uh, personnel group. Uh, and and again, it, it's really like that the technique behind this. It's that muscle memory, and I mean, just doing that movement over time, you're going to strengthen different muscles that mm-hmm. maybe the weights don't really strengthen. Uh, you know, so it, it's just cool to see the the little context in practice and what it means. Um, and this looks like he's honestly doing it off to the side uh, while everyone else is doing their uh, other individual drills. So uh, good to see that type of attention from Gabriel Davis, a guy that uh, I'm sure we're probably going to talk about later at the end when we answer some of these Ooh. questions as a guy that we uh, expect to obviously step up and get a lot more snaps and become more of a focal point for the Bills offense. Yeah, he's somebody who he's gotten a lot of attention recently. And for those of you who don't know, who are just uh, tuning in live or don't follow us on Twitter. First of all, if you don't follow us on Twitter, what are you doing? Get what it together. Doing? Like, yes. stop. Be Just Gosh. be better. That's what we all need to be better. Goodness gracious. But we kind of put some feelers out there into the Twitterverse today in terms of some questions, thoughts, or concerns, or anything uh, anybody wanted answered for us. And we pulled several of those questions. We'll be answering them on the back end of this episode. So thank you very much to those of you who uh, gave us some questions on the old Twitter. And we got some, honestly, like, not even just to say, we got some really good ones, like good thought-provoking ones that we were just talking about uh, offline before we even um, – came into everything here and yes, we're excited for that part, but oh, we're on the same page. As soon as I saw the little icon go up, I was like, I'm already, I'm already on my way with it, my man. We are going to dive into the meat of this show. Now the person that majority of you are here to see, especially Silas who thinks Boogie Basham's going to nail a uh, seven and a half sacks this year coming up. Mr. Boogie Basham, somebody who, as Eric and I have stated uh, from time to time that we weren't the highest on when that selection was made. And, you know, our, how high we are on him now may vary a little bit, um, you know, not to really dampen uh, things too much. But what what it was a key thing in, in us wanting to talk about Basham here in this episode is his role on this team. And it's something I've stated multiple times this offseason in terms of what the – who who that second edge presence is in terms of productivity and pressure rate. And, you know, you look at last year, Jerry Hughes led the team in pressures. Mario Addison was third. They're both gone. If you're looking just total snap share, Jerry Hughes was second on the defensive line in snap percentage. Mario Addison was fourth. Both those guys are gone. Von Miller's here now, but somebody else has to take up that mantle right now. The only known quantity in terms of pass rush productivity for me, I'll speak for myself here, is that Oliver. He's the second best pass rusher on this defensive line, aside from Von Miller. So who right. takes that next jump? And Eric, I thought it was very, very telling that Sean McDermott, a guy who normally keeps things close to the vest, came out and said something in that vein last week to open up OTAs. And he was asked directly about Gregory Rousseau, Boogie Basham, and AJ Epinesa. And he was asked roughly, you know, what do you need from these guys this year? What do you expect? And Sean McDermott came out and said, quote, this is an exact quote. This is going to be a big off season for those guys. They're in a position where they have to, you know, we need them to really grow and develop and make a mark on our defense and not just in a supporting role, but in a primary role. Eric, I thought that was tremendously telling. Somebody in the chat last week on the Skies coverage said it was kind of like a shot across the bow towards the three yeah. young edge rushers to kind of like challenge them and set an expectation or a bar for them to reach. And, you know, we're talking here about Basham tonight, but he falls into that group of, you know, somebody has to step up because there needs to be another edge presence on this team aside from Von Miller. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I, I put some of the snap percentages, courtesy of Football Outsiders, in, into a spreadsheet. Uh, the top section is 2021, uh, 2020 below that, and then uh, 2019. You can see some of the defensive snap rate percentages uh, last year. Rousseau obviously played a huge role, was mm-hmm. amazing versus the run, had his ups and downs as a pass rusher. But you can see Jerry Hughes, 51.8% snap rate. Mario Edison, 44.7% snap rate. Um, F.A. Obata, 22% mm-hmm. snap rate. But then you can see Carlos Basham's at the very bottom at 18.6, and he got a lot of his snaps uh, specifically towards the end of the year. Um, but obviously, Hughes, Addison are gone. Obata's gone. That's nearly 1,200 snaps that mm. aren't going to be there at the edge 
next year. Obviously, Von Miller is going to be in there. So what? Maybe 500, 600, probably tops uh, mm-hmm. snaps for him. So you still have a good five, 600 snaps, maybe even more uh, between, as you said, AJ Epinesa, Rousseau, Basham. Um, those guys were big investments by Bean. And he's, you know, really, I would say going and getting Von Miller is really a testament to the way he's drafted some of these guys, like maybe not quite panning out as quickly as he thought they would. Um, so there's some snaps to be had here. And I do think, obviously, they're relying on Basham and Epinesa to stand up. Uh, stand out a little more uh, this year, uh, especially Epinesa, man. Like, you mm-hmm. know, the first couple of years he's had, they were solid. We saw some flashes, um, but he didn't hit where I thought he would be by, la- yeah. by you know, 2021. So um, it's a make or break year for him because they brought Shaq Lawson back. And Shaq Lawson, when he left this defense and this scheme, he was producing, all right? He mm-hmm. was one of the better run defenders in the league. He was – really effective as a pass rusher. Now you can talk about quality of sacks and quality of pressures <laughs> and, you know, we can get into that nuance. We've done it before, but I will say there is some context that is left out when you just look at the box score stats of his numbers. But mm-hmm. I will say his last year, 2019 in Buffalo, he had 14 QB hits on top of the sacks and his uh, what, 2020 in Miami. He also had several sacks and 15 QB hits. So what we do know about Lawson is he's a very good run defender. He's going to get his QB hits. He's going to affect the quarterback. So bringing a guy like Lawson back who knows this defense and feels comfortable in this defense and is also a spark plug emotionally, Mm -hmm. if he can kind of capture that 2019 form in the Bills defense, he's really going to start pushing A.J. Epinesa and Carlos Basham. Yeah, that's a great point. He, If he is the Shaq Lawson that we've grown accustomed to here in Buffalo, and you know what, even if he doesn't have that, pass rush upside potentially he you know he's going to bring you know his hard hat and set that edge in the run and be a solid run defender he has a skill set or a trait or a role that he can rely on and he can hang his hat on and neither Epinesa or Basham at this point have that Gregory Rousseau we're hoping you know takes a jump in terms of his pass rush productivity his plan his technique his moves and all that but at the very least we have a known quantity with him we know his run defending Whether you look at metrics, whether you look at film, Gregory Rousseau's run defense last year was strong. His ability to set the edge, his ability from a football uh, IQ standpoint, his responsibility in in BCR responsibility, just consistently making the right decisions and flashing that athleticism. And, ooh, super chat from Silas again. This crossed my mind today. This Silas, Ooh. this crossed my mind today, and oh, I don't know how much value. On, had, AJ. Oh, but goodness. look at this, and this kind of relates perfectly. So now go look at Daryl Johnson's 2020 year, his defensive snap percentage at 21 percent. But again, his special team snap percentage has always been high. He, in yeah. 2020, it was 57 percent. The year before that, it was 66 and a half percent. That is one area that AJ Appanessa has over Basham uh, mm-hmm. and even Shaq Lawson. As you can see, 33 percent of his snaps last year on special teams. So. Yes, I do think that it, part of me is like, yes, Bean likes to give those young players time. Mm-hmm. But, and obviously, Epinesa was drafted a lot higher than Daryl Johnson. Um, <laughs> but they also kind of set him back by having him, you know, suck weight, which is something let's talk about with, uh, with Basham, yes. right? He came in a little leaner and mm-hmm. he looks fast, he looks explosive. We heard all of those things before with AJ Epinesa, and it hasn't. Yeah. But you can see he's quicker and he's, his burst yes. off the snap and off the ball is it is better. But what has it gotten him? It hasn't gotten him too much. So I don't know where, what, how that translates to Basham's game when they ask him to get a little lighter. I don't know. I wonder that too because it's been something that – and I think about this all the time with AJ Epinesa, not to give him a pass or anything like that because this is not that, but he gets drafted in the height of COVID. And then within that, they ask him to transform his body – And then still within that, he has to learn how to be an NFL player, which is hard enough on and off the field without having to transform your body and having a COVID offseason. I feel like those things have stunted his potential progression and growth a little bit. And you see those flashes from him at time to time from time to time. I would say we saw more flashes from him last year than we did from Basham, although Basham, you know, was a rookie and AJ was in his second year. But there are I think it's fair to have significant questions when you're looking at, at that edge position and to ask a variety of, you know, follow up questions or have potential like possibilities and theories there. Like Silas, like does somebody, you know, like Epinesa get traded? Do they cut bait on 
I, I wouldn't say bash them, but Epinesa would fall more into that category. And air to your point, you know, them going out and getting Von Miller, that's fair. I don't, it's, I don't want to knock any, you know, any of the other edge rushers, you know, or compare yeah. them to Von Miller, but you spent a first round pick on Gregory Rousseau last year and a second round pick on Carlos Basham. You spent a second round pick on AJ Epinesa the year before, like you've invested significant draft capital in the edge position. And then you still have brought in free agents within that to kind of let those guys be eased in. And now you have to go and make a big splash free agent signing. There's questions that are being asked of this edge rushing group. And, you know, to kind of shift that spotlight again towards Carlos Basham, he's somebody who last year had, Oh, actually, you know what? Let's take a look at some uh, passers productivity numbers and yes. standards. And Eric, yeah, what, what catches your eye here as you bring this up? Well, like I just want to reset like where we are with him because he's a guy that we didn't really like coming out. We didn't think nope. he was as pro ready as most people were using that term with him. Um, and so it's something you talked about during the week on Twitter is like how you perceive a player in his first year, second year, third year. Oh. Uh, is it, it really heavily relates to how what you thought of that player coming out. So with us, I did, we didn't expect a standout player in Basham. Mm-hmm. And again, it's a limited sample, 18.6% of the snaps yeah. last year. But even the high points, they were meh, you know. Man. So and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna show them. We're gonna show some yes. of those high points to kind of again show that that frame of reference because we didn't expect a standout player. We didn't get one, limited sample, all that context. Yes, that's true. Um, but I did expect uh, oh, the other thing that we should talk about, as you said, they kind of doubled up on it, too. That was the other kicker with that tied yeah. to that pick. Right. So yeah. there's that, too. So um, but let's reset. Let's, you know, kind of reference uh, Boogie Basham's play in regards to the rookies in his class. And if you look at it from the top down again, 20 percent of the pass rush snaps last year, uh, the draft class of 2021 edge position, pass rushing productivity. A per, a courtesy of Pro Football Focus, and we look at the the PRP right here. You see, it's seven point oh. So again, limited sample, hundred and twenty eight pass rushes uh, out of one hundred and thirty pass rush uh, pass snaps. Um, he had a pretty good productivity rating when you talk about his sample. Now, again, that was only four sacks. Again, PFF doesn't count half sacks. So if you got a half sack, he, he got an assist there. He gets the old, the whole QB mm-hmm. sack. So four sacks. Zero QB hits, 10 hurries, so 14 total pressures, a 7.0 PRP rate. Um, And most of that, you saw him kind of bounce between the left and right side, which is nice. You want to have a guy that's versatile in that regard, something that, um, you know, not every defensive pass rusher has. So Mm -hmm. from the top down, this draft class, and you look at his limited sample, again, he's got one of the lower end pass rush snap rates here. but he was productive, Anthony. So from top down, it's it's okay. Yeah, it's it's not <laughs> it's not terrible. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying here, man. I'm trying. Come on, we're really trying. Uh, I want to pull up the super chat real quick from Ned. Ned, you are a constant supporter of ours. We greatly appreciate you. Ned says, "Is AJ Epinesa a potential Wyatt Teller?" I love how Teller has just like. I feel like that one trade is going to follow being for forever because he traded away Teller and Teller became an all pro and arguably the best at his position. Um, I think for me, you know, Teller showed a little bit more consistency when you go back and watch the tape. I think Epinesa, you're still very much hoping. And again, something that I, I don't want to discount Wyatt Teller or the bills, I, I don't think it's a guarantee that if Wyatt Teller stays with the Bills, he becomes the Wyatt Teller that he has been in Cleveland. He went That's to fair. Cleveland with offensive line coach Brian Callahan, who is one of, if not the Bill, best offensive Bill line. Oh, say, who, who's, yeah, oh, God. oh, I'm combining yeah, Brian Kelly. You can't confuse <laughs> I'm, those two. <laughs> I'm confused. I'm confi- combining Brian Kelly. I don't know why he's in my head with Bill Callahan. Callahan. Yeah, one Bill of the best. Callahan. Yeah, one of the best for sure. And this goes back to his time even when – um, you know, he was a Raiders head coach and position coach with them before, like their offensive lines were great every single year. He, Teller goes to Cleveland, works with Bill Callahan and Callahan just, I think I don't want to give him all the credit, but I think it's one of those scenarios where I think it's, I don't think it's a guarantee that if Teller stays, he just becomes Wyatt Teller. I think you right. have to add in the system and the coaching staff that helped mold him in Cleveland. Right. Yeah, and the other thing is there are a lot of other factors. You know, Teller was slowly developing, and there were talks that 
He was struggling with the playbook at the time. His body wasn't quite where they wanted it to be. Then you had Bobby Johnson coming in. He brought his own guys with him, John Feliciano. So there were other factors, and they wanted they didn't want to have too young of an offensive line, especially at some of those positions when you have your franchise quarterback starting to develop. So Bobby Johnson probably had a, a major part in this, although he will say that he he probably didn't because obviously Bean's the one that pulled the trigger. Yeah. Um, but AJ Epinesa is a little different uh, just yeah. because I, I think Bean has obviously, you know, invested more at that position um, and it's a mm-hmm. premium position. So um, it's either this season is one of those put up or shut up, you know, season. Mm-hmm. So um, there are things, there are other factors at play here than maybe the, the Wyatt Teller something. So I don't think that would be the case. I don't expect Epinesa to be an all pro eventually. Um, but then again, I mean, who did for Wyatt Teller? I mean, I like, I liked him coming out, but. Um, I will say, no, I don't think he's going to be the next Wyatt Teller. No, I, I, I think that, I, and I don't even think that's a knock against Epinesa, like just the odds no. of him becoming an all pro, like the odds of anybody becoming an all pro are, you know, significantly lower um, just because that's such a hard, you know, plateau or level to reach. And, you know, Basham, Basham flashed a little bit, you know, to bring it back to him, you know, focus for this episode, you know, in his use in his usage and passers productivity. And, you know, you talked about that with the PRP and the stats there, but now we kind of flip it from a run defense standpoint in an area where we talked earlier about Gregory Rousseau and how he stood out in his run defense. But if we look at it from an advanced metric perspective with Mr. Boogie Basham, how does he stand out? He was middle of the pack uh, compared to his class. As you can see from a stop percentage, Gregory Rousseau was uh, hands down the number Ooh. one guy. And this is just, uh, you know, the rookie class, but, if you filter it by the league, he's up there as well. He's top, uh, top three, top five, and and most of the run defense categories mm-hmm. uh, according to PFF. But um, you can see uh, again, 102 run defense snaps for Basham right here. Uh, Ten tackles, four assists, um, a six, uh, a six point uh, oh stop percentage, so run stop percentage, which again kind of middle of the pack compared to his class. So. He didn't have many stops uh, versus the run as opposed to Gregory Rousseau with 35. So uh, he crushed <laughs> it in that regard. Um, and he really was a playmaker in that. And when it came to that, that was his forte, you know, stopping the run, getting the offense behind and down in distance and behind the chains. And uh, Basham didn't really help too often in that regard. Um, when he did make stops behind or at near the line of scrimmage, it was usually on a blitz where he could spike inside and Taron was coming mm-hmm. off the edge and he can run down the line of scrimmage and stop the zone run away from him or just blow up the play because he doesn't have to worry about setting the edge. He could just slant inside and, and beat the tackle uh, across mm-hmm. the face. So um, run defense, I, I don't think he stood out like I expected him to. I thought that was his forte coming in, coming mm-hmm. from Dave Clawson's defense, a very similar to high type defense um, in college. I, I thought he would be a little more, uh, he would flash a little more in this area. I thought but overall, it was his hustle, his motor, and athleticism that really stood out, not in the run game, but more so as a pass rusher. And it's funny because usually with those, I shouldn't say usually, but I, at least for me, I expect someone with high effort and high motor to flash more in the run game because so much of it is effort-based and tenacity-based and just being physical and, or violent, whatever verbiage you want to use. And, I, you know, with, with Basham coming in lighter now, right, you know, his usage last year, you talked about it, the heavy, heavy majority of his snaps came at the edge positions, both right and left, which is valuable. But now he's shed some weight to the to the degree that you almost expect him to be used exclusively on the outside now. And here's his snaps by position. You know, you see, look at the, the first four there. They're all some flavor of edge snaps, edge. both on the right and the left. Now, which is nice, Eric, like you mentioned, he's got that right side, left side versatility, which for some who, you know, maybe like, oh, is that a thing? Yes. Like there are guys who are pr- yeah. predominantly right side rushers, left side rushers. So it's nice that he's comfortable putting opposite hands in the ground and, you know, trying to make an impact in that way. But his usage rate for a guy who was talked about similarly to Epinesa when he was a rookie, some of it was talked about, well, Basham can offer you that inside pass rush potential, that inside outside versatility. We already saw last year, even at a heavier weight where yeah. he was playing last year at 285 pounds, he wasn't used that much inside, whether on pass rush downs or versus the run. Now with that weight loss, Mafia's question there, will Boogie's yeah. weight loss help or hurt him? I'm less focused on how much it helps him or hurts him and focus more on if that pushes him further initially pushes him further into that edge 
category, but he already was there last year. So for me, I think it helps him because if he's going to be lighter, maybe it gives him more pop off that edge because one of the things in the film, um, you know, again, not to harp on him, you just see that lack of explosiveness. You see that not even when he has that good get off and he times the snap, you don't really see that burst. You don't see that quick no. change of direction and that fast twitch. So maybe with him shedding some weight, it allows him to have more of that fast twitch, especially if the bills were playing him mainly outside at that weight last year, kicking his weight down even further, it almost not exclusively, but you would think it heavily increases the odds of him staying outside from a usage perspective. And, you know, over the years, I think this, the staff has kind of realized and self scouted, uh, how they're using some of these guys. And I think that maybe that was another thing that kind of stunted the development of these guys, uh, mm -hmm. on the edge, you know, trying to put too much on their plate again, not trying to cop, you know, cop out with them, but like, honestly, like, you know, it was something that we talked about with Boogie It's something we talked about Ep Epinesa with their size. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. They can kick inside. It, it <laughs> sounds great, but they didn't do it often. And, and when they did, it was usually in blowouts at the end of the game when it's an yep. obvious passive situation, the team's going to just throw the ball down the field. So, um, I do think that I agree. I think, you know, kind of cutting his weight, it, it's probably gonna not put him inside. I don't know, he wasn't in there often, 16, exactly. 17 snaps. But I think also the investment that being made and aggressiveness at interior defensive line, you know, the mm -hmm. Daquan Jones, obviously at Oliver, so they're Tim Settle. Like, let those guys eat, mm -hmm. those bigger bodies eat with their athleticism because those guys are bigger. Jordan Phillips, another big guy, but can rush the passer. They're pretty light on their feet. Um, use those guys in there. Like, don't worry about – uh, using Basham in there until you need him as like the spider defender that a la Mario Addison last year when mm -hmm. uh, the Bills would put out three or four defensive ends on that, you know, in there. He'd be in a two point stance as a defensive tackle, dropping in the coverage underneath. Mm -hmm. They're only rushing three, which now will include Von Miller. So three and a half, four guys. Um, so I think just cutting his weight, maybe we see that 9.39 RAS pop out because on film, mm -hmm. we didn't really see it. Uh, yeah. in his rookie year. So uh, as you can see, uh, some of those snaps by position courtesy of PFF. So um, we'll see, man. We'll see how that weight loss helps his game or hurts his game. I, I think it's time to just let those edge guys, especially the young ones, focus on playing edge and winning at their new weights and, mm -hmm. and what's being asked of them now as each year progresses and new things are added. Um, and so let's get into the film, man, because uh, I think we spent a little too much time yakking and we – this is a film room. Like we got to get into the film here. So let's Probably. dive into some film here, Anthony. Let's start with this play against the Texans. This is week four, third nine situation. And so we talked about quality and the quality of his pressures and quality of the QB sacks that Basher made. You see him circled right there. Third mm -hmm. nine situation. This is one of those plays where the coverage kind of helps him get home. So to the bottom of the screen, you're going to see Trey white shut down Brandon cooks. And they're just running a little two man concept right here to the bottom of the screen. Um, quarterback Davis Mills is looking there. There's nothing there. It's shut down. So he kind of pulls it down. Basham, again, doesn't let the quarterback get outside the pocket there. He contains him. You'll see it better from the end zone angle. And that's one of his sacks here, Anthony. Uh -huh. Again, one of his strengths, and it's something that going back to college, is his ability to not just compress the pocket, but consistently evaluating where that quarterback's setting up in the pocket and where he wants to escape when things aren't on platform, when things aren't in, on script. Yeah, similar to Gregory Rousseau in that regard, which, yep. you know, made that double dip last year even more of, you know, kind of an head indicator scratching. of what, the, yeah, yeah, yeah of a head scratch yes. for sure. But also, <laughs> yeah, like, for, right? this is what we want. We want pocket compressors. We want guys who aren't bendy and who aren't getting around the edge. We want to compress the pocket in on the quarterback. And, you know, fair credit to, to Basham here. I think this goes, you know, his, like, like you said, his ability to understand angles and leverage within the pocket and how to not let that quarterback escape. And you combine that with the high motor that he shows and it results in a positive sack from him here. And you see, boom, you're highlighting there. So the leverage of that pocket, you see Sarlatule driving his man back, which is going to force Davis Mills because the depth of the pocket is now no longer secure. Mills has to then roll out to be able to escape that and try and create a throwing lane for himself. And Basham plays it really well. He's cleared himself uh, from the offensive tackle. He's able to stay free there. And he's right there to meet Mills when he tries to escape. Now, again, this is that contact piece or context piece because you see it and it shows up in the box score is like, oh, 
Like Basham had a sack today. Nice. But it's not in that vein of let me line up, win a one-on-one, and just go make a play. It's a nice right. play from Basham, but it comes within the context of doing his 111th and someone else helping out within that play. But again, it is his ability to compress, stay leveraged against the quarterback, combined with his effort that uh, shows him up on the stat sheet there. Yeah, and this is one, the Chiefs game, the first Chiefs game is one of the better games from him. And it's something we broke down, man, going into that divisional mm-hmm. game is how to contain Mahomes. And this oh is one of the plays we talked about. And they didn't about. do it. <laughs> and they didn't do it. They didn't listen to us. They didn't They didn't contain Mahomes. They didn't do three-man rushes, but it's okay. Dude, right. it was so infuriating to watch the next week when the Bengals did three-man rushes and everybody was like, what a great game plan. And I was like, we said that game plan. Yep. Yep, Mahomes is one of the worst quarterbacks when there's only three men rush. Anyways, moving on. So Basham's <laughs> ability to track the quarterback and contain him. Again, this is where you kind of see that athleticism. So you see the run to pass transition right there uh, as a tackle comes out to meet him. And then you see him go inside with a rip. And again, give, you know, give it a handful to the tackle and the guard. And then the spin, you know, he he's Mahomes is thinking, oh, yeah, I'm probably going to be able to escape out this way. And then mm-hmm. just a slight spin move. Something Basham loves to do is spin moves. And sometimes he'll yeah, he does stack them. You see him, boom, right there. Now he's back to his contained responsibility. And then he, he does another spin move back the other way and eventually tracks Mahomes down. That's where you kind of see that athleticism uh, you know, stand out. But again, off the ball, you're not really seeing it. You see him process, run the pass, and then just work mm-hmm. to contain Mahomes. Not a bad job by any means. Uh, but this is what he's really good at, containing quarterbacks and reevaluating, reassessing where that quarterback is in the pocket or where he wants to escape. You see his athleticism show up in confined spaces. Like when he's in the teeth of, you know, the trenches against the offensive line, you see that athleticism, especially when he can keep that spin move tight and he's able to, you know, feel the leverage from a guard or tackle. And like you said, um, spin around. But this for me again, like, like we mentioned a little bit on the last play and it's a word you mentioned earlier. It's one you mentioned in the DMS when we were talking about him. It's, it's the motor, it's that effort. Like he is consistently trying to do something and whether or not it works, he's trying, whether it's a, whether it's a, you know, speed to power and a bull rush, whether it's a rip, whether it's a spin, whether it's multiple spins on one snap, he is consistently trying to make a play. And it's that high effort that, you know, yields success for him regularly. And you see it on this one, like he's able to track down because he never gives up. He doesn't just stop. He doesn't just, eh, all right, whatever. Like he keeps consistently trying to make a play right off the jump. He tries that rip. The rip isn't there because the tackle has support coming from the inside. So he feels that gets around the edge. Mahomes goes to make a play. He's got to spin again. And then I love the retrace backtracking like how he plants right there on that outside leg shows that leverage is able to sink down a little bit push back out get back up field and get after Patrick Mahomes so you know again a nice a nice effort and a good reward for him you know showing up on the stat sheet again yeah and and I really like his read his ability to read his teammates so he's got Ed Oliver next to him on this play and they're running a little game and of course when you have Ed Oliver you want him to attack you want him to to rush the quarterback as best he can. And he's a guy that's always upfield quicker than mm-hmm. most people on that defensive line. And when a defensive lineman, a defensive tackle gets upfield like that, you got to have some kind of replacement to the interior uh, here. And you can see Basham do that. So as he get as Ed Oliver gets upfield, you see Basham loop inside and Tooney's right there with him. But look at Basham's eyes. He's not really rushing to beat Tooney because he's mm-hmm. expecting Oliver to get some kind of pressure on him. And Oliver does. He gets the inside lane in that B gap there. And then pressures Mahomes, uh, as does Groot off the right side here. So the pocket's compressing here from Oliver and Groot. And so the Basham's just waiting for Mahomes to escape. And he's right there to help bring him down. So, again, tracking the tracking the quarterback there, forcing that incompletion, working off of his teammate at Oliver, who, again, we expect to be in the quarterback's face and shooting up field often. Um, just a really nice play from Basham. And obviously the other uh, defenders really uh, rushing Mahomes there. This is a nice play because I it, I feel like to the naked eye, it just looks like, oh, well, like he got no pressure. He can't even like get in the backfield like he does nothing. But exactly like you said, like the context of it, I, I like what he does here. Like he sees what's going on and too many times you get too many, especially against a mobile quarterback, you get too many rushers who get up field and they don't maintain integrity in their lanes. And what happens? Quarterbacks escape all the time. And this is a really nice play from Basham to recognize what game is being played up front. 
who he's got next to him, the matchup that's being created here, and then what he can do to kind of function off of what Ed Oliver is doing. And it's nice, you know, he's almost acting like kind of like a spy here. And you see it per- perfectly, like as he makes contact with Tooney and extends his head and his eyes are focused squarely on Patrick Mahomes. He's looking over Tooney and just mm-hmm. eyeballing Mahomes, seeing where Mahomes is going. And Ed Oliver does, like you said, does that great job. He creates that chaos. He gets mm-hmm. Mahomes off the spot and off his platform and Basham's there again to clean up and make a play. So credit to Ed Oliver, but also credit to Basham for making a smart football play and playing, you know, within the structure of the defense and literally just doing his job and not trying to do too much. Yeah, and here's another play, just compressing the pocket, converting speed to power here, um, just compressing the width of that pocket, forcing Mahomes to have to shuffle to his his left there as his eyes go right to left uh, from his angle. And you see him as he's sliding to his left, it causes him to mm-hmm. be off balance and for this throw to go right into the dirt. So compressing the pocket on this play, you see Basham uh, go speed to power, and uh, I think that's Niang he's playing against, right? Um, yep. You know, compressing yeah, that Niang. pocket. Yep, and then just causing that incompletion. So nice pressure again from Basham versus the Chiefs. His success from a pass rush productivity standpoint or just like move standpoint, this was his go-to thing Mm -hmm. last year. Like when he was having success, it was that speed to power. It was getting underneath – um, offensive, you know, linemen and playing with leverage and being able to drive them into that backfield, compressing the pocket, just like you said. And, you know, there, there, honestly, there's a, there's room for this. There is a role for this. It would be nice if he had, you know, primary moves or secondary or counter, um, you know, whatever type of verbiage you want to use to explain it there. But there's something nice about a guy who can just, you know, pin his ears back and just driving another dude into the backfield that impacts quarterbacks. And you see it here on this play. This isn't one that's going to look sexy and maybe it doesn't show up on a, as a highlight for most people, but this gets Mahomes off his spot. He feels it. And because he feels that he starts stepping away to his left, he can't really function in that throw and step through it properly. Exactly. Like you said, he dirts it because he doesn't have a proper lower body set in order to make this throw happen. And that's a credit to Basham because it just speed to power, understanding leverage and driving his man into the backfield. Again, similar to how Gregory Rousseau has had success in his rookie year And going back to that double dip and really seeing this is what the Bills valued in edge rushers and what they were trying to do up front. Yeah, and another thing that the Bills wanted to improve on was stopping the run. Again, as I talked about with Rousseau, like getting the offense behind the sticks, getting him those, you know, second and third and longs where they have to pass. Um, And this is Basham late in the game, the first Jets game, reading the tight end block here and then just squirting inside the C-gap there and just blowing this play up really shortening the edge there, forcing Michael Carter to uh, cut it back with a nice, quick, efficient arm over move over that Mm -hmm. tight end right there. You see it. And then that left hand, he locks it in and then just clears him again, forcing that cut back. And he's able to bring the guy down behind the line of scrimmage. One of his better run stops this season. Yeah, the the hand clearance at the line of scrimmage, like similar to uh, what we showed earlier with Chad Hall and Gabriel Davis, like that nice, quick, arm over that muscle memory type move. And you said it for me, it's that how he locks it in there. Like he gets that nice, quick, tight arm over. There's no wasted motion. There's no, you know, it's not too lanky or too long of a move. And then boom, as you got a freeze frame there, he brings that left arm right over, locks out the arms, of the tight end, out, you know, boxes out the tight end, similar to kind of like a power forward down low in the mm-hmm. post. And he's, he's won this entire side. He shut this entire side off to Michael Carter. This play has nowhere to go but to be cut back. And what's nice about this, not only does he force Carter to go back, he also makes the tackle. This is some of this is a play that for me is encouraging. You know, again, as I as you've mentioned, you and I are both a bit down on him when he was drafted, maybe even still so now. But I'm excited to see potentially what that lower weight looks like for him because when yeah. he flashed short area quickness like this and burst at that 285 pounds, it's like, oh, okay, maybe he can do more of that when he's playing at a lighter weight because he doesn't have that extra mass. Yeah, and I talked about, you know, you saw that play was him reading the the tight end, taking that C gap and making a play on his own. Well, what the Bills did a lot, especially when they they saw a lot of these you know run-heavy teams, is they, they'd run blitz. And so mm-hmm. that allowed a guy like Basham to spike inside, only worry about the B gap, not have to set the edge and process, uh, you know, what gap – the running back is going to enter here. Um, you're going to see um, Taron Johnson blitz off the edge 
And then he kind of calls it off. He calls it off because it's it's a, obviously a pass. But Basham is so quick inside. He hits that that gap right there, that B gap. And then just, again, is disruptive. He uses that power, mm-hmm. you know, to get into the the next adjacent offensive lineman, get into the face of Cam Newton. And then Cam Newton's not able to step into this throw. Uh, so it's something if you're watching broadcast uh, footage, maybe you don't see how close or how disruptive Basham was here. But he affected this throw down the field, a throw that had a wide receiver wide open. And he he airmailed it um, as that receiver, DJ, uh, I think that's more right, beating Dane mm-hmm. Jackson down the field. So uh, this was an important play from Basham, but one that probably slipped under the radar from the broadcast angle. Yeah, this is one where you see the incompletion on on the back end and it's like, oh, you know, like good coverage or oh, what an underthrow. And you don't realize that there was an underthrow because, yeah, look at Cam. Cam is even jumping up into the air a little bit to try and get this over boogie. He's so he's off platform completely trying to jump into the air and make a throw. So he doesn't have his lower body into this throw whatsoever, not ideal mechanics. And it's the reason he ducks this one and he, then he throws it short, but he can't step into this ball whatsoever. And that's purely because of Boogie Basham acting like a bull in a China shop once yeah. again. And yeah, you, you, you said it like DJ Moore is, I actually remember this game because I had DJ Moore on my fantasy team and I was like, Oh, he could have caught this one and I would have taken the points here. Um, but yeah, he had him beat and he can't step into it. And this is, this is part of that relationship, right? Where, you know, can you help out other units when you're struggling? Good coverage can make up for poor pass rush. Good pass rush can make up for poor coverage. And the coverage is beat here. DJ Moore is sick. He gets open on this play. Cam can't step into the throw. And it's all because of that quickness and that initial move from Boogie functioning with the blitz coming from that side. And it's a good play. Again, nice relentless effort in trying to get to Cam. He's not just trying to run by him. He's doing everything he can to affect that throw and impact that throw from Cam. And he does it completely. Yeah, and so this play is from the second Jets game. Uh, another another sack by uh, Basham here. But again, the coverage kind of plays a part in this. So you see Basham at left defensive end. And it's a third and long situation, third and 13. You see everyone dropping back in the, the zone. There's only two guys that get past the sticks. And, of course, the quarterback uh, wants to throw it past the sticks to get the first down. The Bills got some really athletic linebackers, so these checkdowns are more than likely not going to get to the stick. So uh, there's, again, tight, good coverage down the field, uh, and shrinking those passing lanes, and then just bash them, that motor, that tenacity, staying with it, that spin move to hold, to hold Wilson from getting out the uh, right side of the pocket there, uh, and he contributes uh, on the sack on the back end. Here it is from the end zone angle. Again, nothing flashy. Um, mm-hmm. But he once again reads the upfield penetration from the defensive tackle, Vernon Butler, um, gets upfield, kind of pushes the pocket a little bit. So he's expecting, you know, with him kind of getting upfield that maybe Wilson's going to kind of step up into the pocket here. But Latulale is doing a good job of also pushing the center of that mm-hmm. pocket. So then Basham's reading him. And as he comes up to the line of scrimmage, now he's sensing and feeling that, you know, Wilson's going to pop out the left side of the screen here and right side of the pocket. Um, and Basham, go ahead. He does his little spin move. Mm-hmm. Oh, there it is. There's a patented spin move. And again, helps contain it and then track mm-hmm. Wilson down, who's a pretty uh, mobile and elusive quarterback. Oh, he's especially in the pocket. Like he's very yeah. mobile. He's got some speed and he's got some agility to his game. This is similar to you know that one we showed earlier with you know the the, the play on Mahomes where he's not the primary guy generating pressure but you see him looking through his man to the quarterback and he's almost two gapping a little bit here. And I really like it. You know, he makes contact. He establishes the inside leverage and has his, not only his helmet on the inside, but like three quarters of his body to cut off that interior uh, lane of escape there. Yeah. Yeah. You see, you see his eyes, like he's looking right through that shoulder. He's, he created that first contact. He's established, you know, himself inside. He's got that leverage. He's eyeballing Zach Wilson. So Wilson goes inside, he's got him. And then again, reading his man, Russ, or Russell Wilson, Zach Wilson through the tackle. Boom. You see that spin move. He mashes that circle button all day. Like he is spin a hundred percent. Like I imagine playing Madden with him and all he does is just like spin move, spin move, spin move. Like he loves it. And, but this time, you know, again, it's not sexy. It doesn't lead to a sack. Um, completely for him but it leads to the chaos in the backfield that he helps clean up a little bit as everybody gets a piece of him and this doesn't happen if Wilson's able to escape out the front door there 
because yeah. if Basham gets too far inside or gets too occupied with his man, Wilson definitely has the mobility to get outside and then at the very least get a throwaway here. But because yeah. Basham cuts off that that lane and he takes that angle with his understanding of the play, and furthermore, again, what we keep talking about, that effort and that motor, Wilson has nowhere to go, and I feel so bad for him. He turns around, you can tell he's like, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Like, yeah, he just keeps seeing more defenders. Yeah, I, got, I don't got anything. <laughs> I got nothing to do. Like, that's chaos time there. And uh, look at AJ Epinesa making a play. Two of the young guns. Who will step up this year? Very, very yeah, intriguing. It's, it's going to be exciting camp, man. It's definitely going to be exciting. Uh, so we got, uh, I think, one or two more plays here. Another cleanup play here from him. Uh, this is one that you picked out here. Um, so why don't you break this one down? So we got the pressure here from Basham and, and another, or this play here from Basham, another cleanup type sack, like you mentioned here. This is from the wild card game uh, against the Patriots, and you see him get chipped by the running back coming out of the backfield, and it, it changes his angle and his route on this play. So he kind of gets hit, and you can see him kind of try and re-catch his bearings a little bit. Um, it's a good chip, and you see him attack again, but as he starts to come forward, he sees Mac pull the ball down. He sees Mac come forward. And similar to several of the plays we've already shown, what do we see? We see him trace back up field. We see him take an angle. We see the effort and we see kind of like a little chase down play yeah. um, from behind here. And again, it's because he doesn't get too far afield. He, I, li I like this one because he resets his bearings a little bit. Like I mentioned, like he, he gets chipped and it's not like, he's just like, all right, cool. Let me just stay here. Let me keep trying to go outside. He can see how this play is flowing um, in large part due to what Jerry Hughes did by getting yes. inside and just causing that absolute havoc. Um, it's crazy how like pff, valuable pressures can be towards helping other people. Um, <laughs> but I guess that's a conversation for another time or maybe a conversation for never uh, for some people. But Jerry Hughes completely wrecks the uh, depth of the pocket on this stunt inside. I love the angle that Jerry takes, just drives through his man. Matt can't sit at the top of his drop. He has to get forward. And there we give some credit to start with Tulele, you know, working inside. And he forces Mac to have to redirect. Mac tries to escape out the front door. He's got to cut it back. But again, this is everybody doing their job. This play, Mac could maybe potentially get out and escape if Basham's not chasing this down from the backside. Yeah, it's, again, it's something we talked about leading into that divisional game, you know, affecting the quarterback. This is a five-man pressure technically. And you said he's, you know, Hughes is looping in like that. And it's important because that's going to affect the quarterback right down Broadway. Like that's going to affect him. It's going to be five on five here. Um, it's a good read by Basham. He becomes what they call the backstop player. He just circles back out this way and finds where the quarterback wants to escape and ends the play. Like that's, that's exactly what the bills needed to do in that divisional game. And it's something that they have pulled oh. out for mobile quarterbacks. And it's a role that Basham actually played in college and something mm -hmm. again the bills used addison primarily at that spider position or on these backstop type plays uh, we saw it in the jets game uh, from addison as well so really nice play from basham on this keeping his head in the play and again finding where that quarterback wants to escape it's something that the bills are going to have to continue to get better at because they still struggled with it last year um and, and you know it was disappointing to see to be honest because mm -hmm. it's something that uh, we talked about for for a lot of the film rooms and, you yes. know, it's something that, <laughs> again, they're just they're going to have to get better at it. That's partly why they brought in a guy like Von Miller and, and you know, the closer and those third and fourth down plays. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was the last play. Um, yeah. You know, they want that closer. They want that guy that can just finish a drive and finish a game. Silas, again, man, we appreciate you uh, with the super chat here. He says, I think Boogie has the best footwork and pass rush repertoire out of the young guys. I think he's a guy who can show the fastest improvement with Vaughn. What are your thoughts on that, Ant? Um, if by pass, <laughs> stop laughing. If by if we're talking like pure like pass rush moves and like repertoire of the young guys, I actually think it's Epinesa. Um, his hand technique and his hands. clearance and his quickness. Yeah, AJ Epinesa's hands are are and solid. And quick. Yes, they're quick. They're powerful. They're violent. If we're talking from a pure like technique standpoint, which pass rush repertoire to me speaks to like technique and moves and plan. I think Epinesa um, is the best out of the young guys. Um, when it comes to footwork, if you're talking either quickness or clean in terms of the feet, I'd also probably go with Epinesa over Basham. I'd also probably put Groot over Basham as well. Um, but, you know, in terms of who can show the fastest improvement, 
he's the day. I, I think it's fair for any of the three young guys, especially seeing again, like we talked about with Epinesa, but if Basham shed all that weight, you know, I'm interested to see what kind of player he is because of it. Um, and also from positive and negative, like how does it affect his, you know, speed to power move and his bull rush and how he leverages or does yeah. it lead to, you know, more quickness or maybe more speed rush, you know, around the arc type of rush and success for him. So I'm very interested and intrigued to see where he goes. But if we're just going off of what we've seen so far, um, I would put Epinesa ahead of him in terms of footwork and repertoire, um, mainly again, like you said, due to the violence and the technique that Epinesa has in his hands. Yeah, and you know, Epinesa has that length too. You know, I know he oh, lost true. weight; he's not as big, um, but his he's got that type of uh, long arm and power um, that you know Bo- Boogie Basham isn't a guy that's always going to win first contact, which we talk about a lot true. because he's got shorter arms. But yeah. he can, like you said, become a bull in a china shop, and none of that matters where he just blows up the width of the pocket. Yeah. Um, but I think all three of the the guys that we've talked about tonight, Epinesa, Rousseau. And Basham, I think all of them are pretty limited when it comes to pass rush repertoire. Yeah. And, you know, even some of those flashes, like, okay, beyond the first move, you know, seeing a second move or seeing a counter, like, we haven't really seen it from either of them consistently. So no. it's, it's, it's wait and see for me. Um, uh, but I, for the most part, I do agree. I think the hands, the quickness, the hands, the violence um, of Epinesa is ahead of the other guys. Um, but, the other guys win in other areas. So that's, what's great about, you know, the, the room that Bean has created, he just got to get more consistent consistency from them. Um, and it's going to come this year because there's a lot of snaps to be had. So uh, with that said, let's talk about um, real quick, just the usage. And, and then we'll go into some of the questions to wrap this up. Um, so let's talk about what we expect from Basham this year. As I said, you know, there are a lot of snaps to be had here. And I do think mm-hmm. that, Epinesa, Basham uh, are really going to get pushed by Shaq Lawson because he's hungry. Mm-hmm. He's back in Buffalo. He's comfortable in the system, as we talked about. He's really going to push them for some snaps. Um, and if he can play anywhere near, near 2019, those guys may not see the field as much as they did last year. Yeah. I think that's a very fair point. Like, I, you know, again, for so expectation is all going to be tied into the usage and the usage is going to be tied into, you know, the rotation and snap share percentage. And so we know what Vaughn Vaughn is the alpha Vaughn is going to get like that number one snap share and usage. Um, I expect Gregory Rousseau to command number two, just because of his ability in the run defense game. Like you mentioned, like in stops in stop percentage in run stop win rate for ESPN, like he's very successful across multiple metrics from multiple sites. Like Gregory Rousseau is legitimate against the run. I also expect him to see an uptick in his pass rush productivity based on what he said last week, based on what he's trying to do from the mental side of things to combine it with the physical gifts that he already has. And then, you know, honestly, like I, again, it's all about the known quantities I think Shaq Lawson could be a sneaky guy who sees the third most snaps at edge this year because of what he offers in the run and because he's yeah. that guy who the, the the coaching staff knows. Okay, dude, who's 2019? Who not to interrupt you, 2019. Do his snap rate was 46.2 percent. That would put him right where Mario Addison was last year at 44.7. So, and yeah. uh, the next tier down from that was 30.6 uh, percent. AJ Epinesa. So. Yeah, there's a good chance if Shaq Lawson's balling, man, like he could steal snaps from Epinesa. Again, they don't have Obata, who Obata, when he was in, was pretty effective and efficient and kind of violent. And again, kind of a spark plug in some of these games. Man, I don't know. Maybe we're just not talking about Lawson enough, but I think at the very least, Lawson does push those guys and he he could very well steal snaps if someone asked in the chat. Yeah, and and especially with... What do we know the Bills defense likes to do? Their nickel defense, they like to go light boxes. It's nice to have another edge rusher or another person on that D-line who's strong at the point of attack, who knows his gap fits and his run responsibilities, who's sound and fundamental in that area. It's one less thing you have to worry about when you're dealing with the multitude of complexities that are NFL offenses today, especially given the caliber that several Uh, of the offenses the Bills are going to face have. They're facing Kansas City again this year, and they're facing the Cincinnati Bengals this year, and they're facing the Rams and all these teams that are successful offenses and good passing teams but who also can attack a light box with their run game. That's part of the reason why I think Shaq Lawson might see an uptick. I think he's still, like you mentioned, I think he's still that same four to six sack guy if he gets into some hustle sacks or gets some things pushed his way. But you could do a lot worse than having a guy who's stout against the run um, from an edge perspective. 
on a team that likes to play with light boxes and lighter personnel as a whole. And then again, so tying it into Basham, I really think it's how he he sets the tone for himself from a pass rush standpoint. Um, you know, like you mentioned, I thought we both thought he'd be better against the run last year. And statistically, yeah. you know, we didn't see it a ton. I'm interested to see how the cut in weight helps that. But given the cut in weight, given the addition of Shaq Lawson, I think the expectation for him might be from a pass rush role, whether situationally or just overall. And so my expectation for him is to see somewhere in terms from, of the edge rushers, anywhere from third to the fifth most snaps um, from an edge perspective. And I expect to see an increase in sna- sack sack usage or sack rate this year, just because of, I have getting more opportunities in that area. But um, I, it's, I don't want to be negative. I don't have like a ton of like high hopes. I think he is what he is for me. His ceiling is still Shaq Lawson, but now that he's cut weight, is he more of a pass rush presence and threat? That's that for me is going to be uh, heavily tied into my expectation for him in usage. Yeah. And, and what's interesting to me after looking at some of the PFF stats with, we're talking Epinesa versus Lawson and Basham is that when Lawson left here in 2019, a lot of his production came on the right side. Uh, so hmm. where they obviously put Von Miller, he can play both sides. Groot was yeah. primarily on one side last year at the left, yeah, side. left side. So, um, that second wave, and this is where I want to frame the conversation. It's the second wave, right? You got your Von mm-hmm. Miller, you mm-hmm. got your Gru as pretty much your starters there, um, you know, chasing opposing quarterbacks and creating that chaos early. Um, and so that second wave, who's it going to be? Is it going to be Basham and Epinesa or Basham and Lawson? I, I, we talked about Lawson playing both sides, and he can, but when he left in 2019, his his production came off the right side. So – I do think that Lawson will push Epinesa, but either way, that second wave needs to continue, you know, that hustle and tenacity and be that, Mm. um, that group that doesn't let up because, you know, you got a hall of famer and Von Miller chasing quarterbacks on early downs. And in those, uh, prime downs and distances, uh, you want that second wave when they come in for that drive after, you know, that third drive or every third drive, you want them to, to, you know, keep the the foot down on the pedal and, 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 chase the quarterback and of, of course don't lose anything and not have a drop off versus the run game. So that's what I expect with Basham. What I do like about what he brings, as you saw in some of this film is how he reads his, his uh, you know, adjacent defensive lineman. Again, they retooled the interior defensive line mm-hmm. and not only are they bigger, but they can, they're nimble. They can, they can rush the passer. And so seeing how those two mesh together, you know, if, if, if uh, Tim Settle is in there at nose tackle and with that Oliver or Daquan Jones, George Phillips, like those bigger guys are in there and they're running those games, something that the Bills had, sh- they struggled with the last couple of years with Eric Washington. If they can run those games with the bigger guys, looping outside, keeping Basham inside to become that spy, that contained player mm-hmm. and still getting that pressure as you saw or what we saw from Shaq Lawson when he was paired with Jordan Phillips a few years ago. Like, if they can somehow find that kind of role for Basham with being a little lighter, being that Addison-type player, uh, backstop player as we saw, and kind of maximizing that role, that's great to have versus a lot of these elusive and mobile quarterbacks going forward. So second wave, keep the pedal to the metal, and again, just keep uh, attacking that quarterback and uh, don't let up there. So with that said, let's wrap up with a few questions, Ant. The first one came from our guy, Fernando, who uh, was a contributor at Cover One for many, many years. And he brought this up the other day when I appeared on Food for Thought with Nate and Bruce Noll. And he asked about Boogie Basham. And he said that Boogie reminds him of Mario Williams a bit. But in the sense that being really dominant, some snaps, but disappearing for stretches. Anthony, do you think that makes sense? And um, I know it's a little hard with only a few snaps and limited sample, but... That was kind of his takeaway from Basham's rookie year. Um, would you agree or disagree with that? I agree with the disappearing part. I don't think he had the high end <laughs> flashing of. <laughs> oh, well, that was that was perfect, man. Was... I don't, I don't agree with the high end flashes of Mario Williams. Um, but I, I think I think overall, like what he means in that, I, I see where he's coming from because you do see those hustle sacks or those flashes where you're like. Oh, look at nice. And then I'll, I'll, I'll even put it into a good, good perspective. There are times where I had to, like, I knew, 
I knew what Basham looked like in a game. Like he was wearing the long sleeves and he had like white gloves and white, you know, spikes. And I could tell he was different from everyone, but I would see him on the field and I would lose him in the play. Cause he did nothing yeah. like, and like I think wash. that, yes. You know, or, and just, or the and, attacker was aggressive and jump set him and just eliminated any type done. of plan that he had going and just shut yes. him down easily like and i think that's where that disappearing part comes in so i get where you and i i think that's actually a i don't think it's completely accurate because mario's high-end flashes were like mm. impact yeah. like drive killing high impact it's a tough plays. comp like it's it's yes. hard to say mario williams because like yes. the guy was absolutely dominant. dominant for a long time and he did he's got a totally different skill set than Basham. Yeah. So But I get what yeah. he means. Like he yeah. means that guy who like makes a play and then you forget that he's on the roster of the field for some time and then he makes another one. And you're like, oh, okay. So he doesn't have that high end flash. But mm. I agree with yeah, that I, I know where he's coming from in that question. Yeah, I, like I said, I would agree. I, I just don't I didn't see I didn't see a drive where Basham was dominant. I didn't see yes. two reps back to back where he was just dominant versus many of the offensive linemen that we saw. And I mean, you saw that play versus the Panther. I think it was a Panthers right tackle, like a no name guy. And yo, know, yeah, he won that rep, but it's like, uh, it's still, but then there's also reps level where level competition. He tries to get up field on that right tackle and tries to pull a spin move. And the guy, he literally just like gets caught and gets grabbed. And like, you can tell right. the tackle is looking at him like, dude, what the hell are you trying to do? Like, what is going right. on right now? Like, and I think that point you made an excellent one. I never saw him make impact plays on back to back snaps. Yeah. Right. In any game. Right. Yeah. It's, it's tough, man. I like, I, he was a high investment and there's just a lot to be desired from him uh, going forward. And uh, yeah, hopefully that he, he knows how to play and is able to adjust uh, playing at a lighter weight. So with the next yeah. question, let's go into is defensive player of the year a realistic possibility for any Bills this year? Also, is there a path for Trey getting comeback player of the year? That's from Joey Hanover on Twitter. I'll start with DPOY. Is that a realistic possibility? Ah, that's tough, man, because that's usually a certain position, right? That that goes to um, usually an edge type player. Mm -hmm. um, I don't Basham. think, yeah, I know. Yeah, that was, or we're out of here. Basham with DP, why? Like, we're out of here. Um, no, I think I would like to see, like, I want to see Ed Oliver take that step, right? That would like, be awesome. You know, big contract come in, chip on his shoulder. I want to see him uh, come out and, and make a play like that, uh, that type of run. But I just don't, especially with, like, because everyone comps him to Aaron Donald, you know, like, but I, I think, it's probably not likely, but I if I had to throw a dark horse out there, I'd say Ed Oliver maybe. I think that that, that he was my second potential choice. Um, a lot of the Defensive Player of the Year awards, they go to like – they go to usually edge rushers or guys on the, yeah. they either go to edge rushers or they go to Aaron Donald um, yeah. <laughs> or, or they go to a secondary player who has an unreal year, like an Ed Reed or a Troy Palomalu or, or a Charles Woodson, where you're, you're getting sacks and interceptions and touchdowns. This was my number two right time. there. Ooh, oh, Jordan Poy. Poe right? was my number two coming back. He's, he's going to come play. Yeah. You know, like he's going to come play chip on his shoulder. He would be my number two. He, I did, I'm playing it from the perspective of like, who are the voters going to vote for? Right. And I think Oliver would be my second. My number one, if Von Miller comes out and puts out hmm. like 15 or 16 sacks and the bills are the one seed and the bills do what everybody thinks they could possibly do. He could be a candidate for defensive yeah. player of the year, because then it's like, then the storyline and it, everything writes itself like Von Miller just won a Super Bowl last year, chooses Buffalo, is leading sack getter or like top five in sacks in the NFL. The Bills defense is killing it. The Bills are, you know, 13 and two or whatever, yada, yada. Like a, I'm from the political side of things. Um, yeah, it would be Von Miller for me because of the position that he plays. And again, his name is sexy. Like the storyline is sexy. Like I'm playing all that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The next question, which young player – in year three or less, are you most optimistic about breaking out in Dawson Knox style? And which player are you most pessimistic about? I'll start with this one. I'm going to take the low hanging fruit as, as far as the most optimistic. And it's because we touted for this guy to get more reps at the end of last year. And that's Gabriel Davis. It's an cool. obvious, I know, low hanging fruit. But hey, I'm sticking to our guns. We said this guy should have been a focal point late last year. He came through for us late in the year. 
um, just because of what he can do in the run game and the mm-hmm. pass game. I'm excited to watch him with Aaron Cromer tutoring him and the staff uh, as far as run blocking, how they use him. Uh, that's exciting to me. He's always been a deep ball guy, you know, 20 plus yard type plays. He's always been a deep threat. Um, I, I think that will continue as teams still try to, you know, bracket and double up Stefan Diggs. I still think he's going to be a red zone threat um, and a threat in the run game. So that one is pretty easy for me. Most optimistic, um, pessimistic, <laughs> ah, man, this is tough, man. I, I think we talked a lot about AJ Appenissa, man. And again, I, last year was a letdown because I did a, a full breakdown on him going into the year and how he had ups and downs, but those yes. flashes, he started getting it at the end of the year. Almost like Carlos Basham last year. He looked um, so good in the preseason too. He in was the dominant. Preseason, yes. And then of course he like he showed out early in the year, but against the Dolphins, like uh, I, I think I'm the most pessimistic for him because again, we talked about the guys that were drafted to you know behind him and the guys that were brought in, and uh with how they are kind of changing. Uh, the skill set that they want from their edge players. And mm. um, I do think Basham does offer more athleticism and that run and chase ability, which the Bills, again, have needed against these mobile QBs. Ooh, um, good answers. Optimistic. Uh, Gabriel Davis is my vote as well. Um, just especially in today's NFL, I love that. You know, he can dig out second and third level defenders in the blocking game, function and play action, but they can also split two high coverages and get behind defenders, uh, which is so valuable in today's NFL and for the Bills offense. Um, but because you said him and I don't want to elaborate too much, I'm going to go with uh, I'm going to go with Spencer Brown. Like I mentioned before we talked oh, about, yeah. I think he he really flashed with his athleticism last year, and I think he got better as the year went on. He still had a lot of things to clean up, even in the, uh, the last game. The, that's like he's a, he's eight. Perfect. <laughs> nice flag, Mark. Oh my dude, God. He really is the, the tenacity, the athleticism, the feet, the hands, mm. like just like he literally ticks all the boxes for Cromer. And, you know, I think he got better as the year progressed. I know he still was rough around the edges, even in the last game of the year against Kansas city, but man, just, I, I really believe in coach Cromer. I know you do too. And yeah. Brown is just like that ball of clay like that high level ball of clay just mm. waiting to be molded by someone he's and a I think perfect Cromer's guy a for Cromer to coach up you know again tall long athletic yes. like mean. nasty like just get if if the the thing that Brown struggled with was his hand technique his hand placement and yes he, was, he carried his hands a little low at times and guys just swatted him out get out into his chest like Cromer is going to, I like your pick, man. Hands. I, I, I really like Cromer's uh, technique with the athleticism and just natural God given gifts that Spencer Brown has. Um, it's going to be exciting to watch his jump from year one to year two, for sure. Same. Yeah. I'm, I'm pumped for him. And then pessimistic. Um, I'm going to go with Basham. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Epinesa is uh, there too, just but I the flashes that I've seen from Epinesa, um, you know, I could honestly flip a coin in either or, but the flashes that I saw from Epinesa, I liked more from a sustainability and potential upside. Um, granted, Basham is completely again rechanged or redefined and transformed his body, so maybe he's a completely different player this year. Um so, you know, that that's factored in there, but it's one of them for me. I love this question from Grant. Grant that's says, where one. does Aaron Cromer rank it of among offseason additions? I put a tweet out last week and I said, it's easy right now to see Von Miller as the highlight of the offseason. But I said, don't be surprised if in 2023, we're looking back on this offseason and Aaron Cromer was the best addition for this entire offseason, especially for 2022 and longevity wise, like what he can get. Out of he raises offensive linemen's floors and their ceilings, he gets the buy-in, his establishing mm-hmm. of technique and fundamentals, and just the versatility that he coaches. I just, I just think it's a great signing, and I think why it could be the best offseason addition is because he'll have an impact across multiple people. Granted, Von Miller, if he succeeds, can as well. But I think for me, Cromer's right up there, like as a one A or a one B or number two behind Von Miller. Yeah, I mean, I kind of have to agree here and um i hadn't thought about this but i think it comes down to the why behind it and that's brandon being what he said this offseason to start he said he wanted to protect josh allen yeah all right and obviously there's some coaching changes bobby johnson going to new york and whatnot dable as well um but 
it didn't necessarily happen in the personnel when it, you know they of course they brought in Saffold, they brought Ryan Bates back, but bringing a guy like Cromer in one of the top offensive line coaches in the league in any of the leagues um, can do wonders for again some of those younger players, and I think he just meshes well for what the Bills want to do philosophically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, when it came to being saying that, um, that sticks with me and also what Sean McDermott said, um, he, he said, they obviously have to protect the quarterback more. Um, and he said it was a priority for him. He said he wanted, um, Cromer, a guy like Cromer to come in because of how well he teaches. And that's one thing when OTA is open and they saw, you know, all these other offensive linemen at different positions that they weren't drafting. He's seen Tommy Doyle, a tackle in at guard. Like people are like, what, what is that? That's mm -hmm. normal for Cromer. That's mm -hmm. normal for his style. He wants his uh, tackles playing at guard. He wants his guards playing at center and guards playing at tackle. He wants everyone to be a hybrid type player or at least have some reps doing it mm -hmm. to understand the concept, the why behind you're running this play and how things unfold in a certain concept from yeah. this position versus where you're normally playing. So he, he said, you know, you're going to suck at it sometimes, but he wants you to test your scheme, test your technique, and, and and you become a better player from that perspective. And so, yeah, I think it's a great question, Grant, and I do think he's up there. If not, he is number one because of what the staff told us all offseason. And I said, um, yes, they brought a couple of small pieces on the offensive line back, but bringing a guy like Cromer and having the backing of Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, he, is, he, he could easily be the top priority, a top win for the Bills regime this offseason. Yeah, very much so, especially, again, like, we talk about and make the joke all the time, like the Bills playbook and you open it up and it's just a picture of Josh Allen. Like Josh Allen is the key <laughs> to this team and the key to He's this identity. franchise. And yeah, he is the identity. And if you got a guy who can strengthen the people protecting the identity, you're in good shape. But all right. So I think we may have covered this one. This is the last one. We've been on a little too long um, without Kendall, which is kind of surprising. We were blown through a lot of these film rooms. That means people, it. That means it's, it's like our fault that we're like that we go along now it's yeah just like exactly exactly but there were some good topics and good questions so uh Very you know true. it's good, good content last question uh from burning bills takes on twitter um we talked about epinesa and basham a lot i know but from a comparisons perspective do you have basham further along than epinesa or not yet like right now no yeah and I, I, you i honestly you could play that in just because epinesa has literally another year ahead of yeah. um basham so i mean i think it's more of a conversation of who would you rather have and where does the value play but right now no i think you know even going to silas's point earlier that question um i just think when you look at the hands and the technique you know granted epinesa's technique isn't you know he's not a world beater and it's not revelatory or anything like that but i do think it is uh much further ahead of basham at this point in their careers yeah, I, I think it's pretty close, uh, but the pressure is obviously on Epinesa because he has that yeah. extra year. Um, but I just, again, it goes back to our initial valuation of Basham. He, just because he played a lot doesn't mean he's necessarily pro ready. And he wasn't a standout last year, and we are not surprised by that. But mm -hmm. we do see the positive and, and a ways to maximize Basham. And hopefully, again, what the Bills did with his weight this offseason, it will maximize some of that athleticism that is apparently in there. But we just haven't seen it all that much on film. Um, but he tested very well coming out. So we'll see uh, if that pans out. So with that said, man, Anthony, that was that was a little long, bro. That was a little long, it but it was a good episode. Kendall's going to run his mouth that we went over. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that's fair. It's, it's honest. But again, like you mentioned, I think – we went a little longer tonight because, you know, OTA starting today and a lot of the good questions and commentary and everything we received on Twitter and everything we had going on in the chat, like was just very engaging um, and thought provoking tonight. So with that said, thank you to everyone who contributed uh, from Twitter and asking us questions. And again, yeah, everybody fun. riding with us live. It was very fun. And everybody who joined us live on tonight's show, thank you so much for joining us, your questions, your thoughts, your comments, your concerns, just being here live watching us. Thank you very much to Ned and Silas for your super chat donations and the questions and commentary that came along with it. For anybody who is still with us here live, please drop a like on this video. I say it every week and I say this every week. I know it sounds corny, but you would be surprised how much a like goes towards helping us to track and trend in front of more eyes and ears. Please subscribe to the cover one film room and to cover one as a whole. If you're listening to this on any one of the podcasting apps or platforms like Google or Apple podcasts or Spotify, please 
review and rate five-star reviews and ratings for the cover one film room check out all the great content that we've got at cover one as a whole we have you covered literally every single day of the week when it comes to buffalo bills and nfl content we are the best to do it for anything you need follow us on the old twitter find myself at pro underscore underscore a n t find eric at what are you eric j turner eric j turner and then yes of course at cover one on twitter for the main handle Boom, knock all those out. And then uh, our other partner in crime who's not here tonight, Kendall Mursky. Find him on Twitter at Mursky Kendall. He's fantastic. Uh, the other part of this Cover One Film Room team. And yeah, whether you watched us live, listened, watched us later, listened to us later, whatever have you, thank you so much for your view, your listen, your download, your time, your attention, your generosity, your kindness. We appreciate the hell out of it. We will see you next week for another episode of the Cover One Film Room. Until then, take care of one another, be kind to one another. I'm Anthony Prohaska. That is Mr. Eric Turner. We appreciate the hell out of you guys. We'll see you next week and go Bills.